Welcome everybody for another episode of Why It Matters, the ship that we are putting together as it sails. So you'll notice now I have a new professional background, courtesy Very of nice looking. Matter. Yeah. yeah. You know, Tim, your little Wait. sign inspired me. Uh, yeah. And, and okay, this is an actual tile <laughs> from Mexico, uh, like hand wow. painted. Isn't that yeah. cool? Mine is an uh, actual system. plastic sign ordered from online. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And what, what's nice. even going to be better about this is we've pre-recorded a bunch of stuff to launch later. So now after you see this episode, there's going to be a bunch where you're like, where'd the nice background go? Why does it look like there's a pile of dirty laundry behind Tracy? Yeah, What's going on sense. with that dog? So it's going to be great. So uh, we are here today uh, with someone whom I've had the pleasure of working with both inside salesforce.org and outside. I've known for a long time, I think, Tim, you've known even longer, uh, Jesse Maddox, who is from salesforce.org and has a new title, which is, I believe, Director of Humanitarian Ecosystem. How, did I get that right, Jesse? Oh, you're on mute. Not not yeah, close-ish. I'm uh, I'm a, a account director for some of our strategic humanitarian uh, uh, customers slash organizations. Yeah, and the interesting thing, uh, Jesse has uh, three letters after his name that I hope we get into a little bit of today, and that is MSW uh, on the LinkedIn's. So I know that is directly connected to this work. I don't know, Tim, you've known Jesse longer and I think you give him more grief than I do. So do you want to add anything? <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I was just trying to think, I think it was 2007. Am I right about that? That you and I met Jesse? It summer was, 2007? yep, it was the summer of 2007, that's right. Okay, so back in the day, I worked for um, a faith-based organization that was in the mission district. It was actually global, so, um, it had sites all over the world. And one of those sites was in San Francisco in the Mission District. And um, there's a house named Casa San Dimas that was a house for Latino gang members to come and find a life together. Um, and it was, it was an amazing place, really, really interesting. The director left to Guatemala for the summer. And so he brought in this, um, this guy we'd never met before named Jesse Maddox. And I was like, man, this is a really photogenic white guy for this position. I, I hope that these kids don't eat him alive. And Jesse just nailed it over that summer. Um, so that's how I met Jesse. He was great with, uh, with the kids, really, um, really down to earth with them. And I was so impressed. And so um, I was really surprised a couple of year, years later to find him in the Salesforce ecosystem. And um, so that's how I met Jesse. Jesse, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you we for would, having me. We would all love to know, um, well, at least I would, um, <laughs> what was the story up to working at Casa San Dimas? Um, do, you mind, yeah. do you feel comfortable sharing that? <clears throat> yeah, of course. Uh, and, uh, you know, as for, for all of us, I think in some ways it was a, a long and winding road. Um, but when I when we met, I was in the middle of my two year uh, MSW program at Berkeley, and I had um, done a good portion of my undergrad at Loyola Marymount in LA. And during my time there, had gotten exposed to Father Greg Boyle, the founder of Homeboy Industries. Um, and if you've ever heard him speak, you don't need to say more than oh, that yeah. because he is a compelling, Dynamite. just compassionate, you know, unbelievable human. Um, and Nothing so had, stops a bullet like a job. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Is that uh, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, jobs not jails. Just a really amazing, you know, person, uh, and that's an understatement. Uh, but I had gotten involved while I was in LA. I worked uh, in um, South Central and Watts. I I coached uh, high school soccer with a group of kids that were, you know, a similar profile to the kids at Costa and Demas. So th these kids were not necessarily gang involved, but they were you know, black and brown and, and, and not, didn't look like me and lived in, in South Central Los Angeles. And I loved working with them and was able to find a way to connect. And, um, and so I was really interested to find ways to build on that. And I actually had reached out to Father Boyle. And when I was 
had made my way up to the Bay Area for grad school and said, do you know anybody doing similar work? And Father Boyle connected me to Nate Bacon uh, of Costa and Bemis. And so I connected with Nate and one thing led to another and I had what was a really amazing opportunity. I swear, to with those boys for the Nate summer. Bacon is kind of like the second Kevin Bacon <laughs> in terms of six degrees. Yeah. I swear it's six degrees of, of separation with Nate Bacon. So, I was just yeah. thinking like the way that you told that story, it's like I wanted to get into politics. So I reached out to Hillary Clinton who <laughs> connected me over to Pete Buttigieg and, and that's where I started my work. Like you yeah. named it, really important people. Right? You, you, you did, yeah. Out, you know? <laughs> Um, I um I was fortunate to get connected to those folks through you know the context I was in and and uh, and I wanted to be a part of that type of work and I like connecting with people and I particularly liked working with like teenage um, kids and particularly boys who maybe didn't have the best environment around them um, because I felt like there was a way you know I was in my early twenties I had an athletic background I could kind of tap into that. Um, and find a way to connect where it wouldn't have been obvious to connect on the surface. And, and I had a background that had sort of me, gone through some different realms of the world. And I grew up in a, in a community that was, um, you know, was a working class mining town. And, and so certainly my experience was very far different, very far from the, the kids that I was working with, but I felt like there was ways to connect on a human level and maybe by knowing what I was and wasn't and, being comfortable with that and just finding a way to build connection. It just was really, really um, meaningful and powerful um, experiences. So um, what happened between that and um, how did you, how did you next find yourself at Salesforce? Or maybe uh, you didn't find yourself <laughs> next at Salesforce, but. Yeah. Yeah. No, it took a couple of years. Uh, so I, I left, out of my, um, I finished my my MSW uh, in 2008, and I loved that that space. But I also knew I didn't necessarily want to be, um, you know, sort of a a, a clinical social worker. Um, and I had done work at um, uh, shelter in Marin for homeless families as my first year internship. And then I was at um, at Costa and Demas in the summer. And then the next year I did an internship in the San Francisco schools at a middle school and high school, uh, Willie Brown Middle School and Thurgood Marshall High School. And so I'd done a lot of work in kind of group setting with kids and then some individual work. Uh, and I just knew that I wanted to um, sort of not go directly down that path. And prior to, to grad school, I had met a, a gentleman who had become kind of a mentor and a friend who had spent most of his life in business education. And he had said to me, I was considering maybe doing a MSW in law. And he said, you know, if you want to be able to get things done, you need to know how to navigate the private sector. And when he first said it, I, I said, I don't have any interest in that. I don't want to go into business. I want to be working with people. And over time, as that sunk in, it made more and more sense. And so I actively sought experience in and a role in the commercial sector coming out of my MSW program. And I had a few people raise their eyes and say, what are you doing, peers and professors? Um, but I felt like I knew why I was trying to do that. And I knew that I, I had faith that it would all converge and come back together as long as I had that sort of intention. And so I found my way into the tech space. I got referred to a recruiter through a friend who said, here's a few things you know, that are opportunities. And one of them was a, was a tech reseller job with a company called Soft Choice um, that was a value-added reseller that did everything, software, hardware in between, and I was learning a completely new language. I had no technology experience, um, but it felt like a really relevant place to be in the Bay Area uh, where I could get some exposure to just the, the you know private sector, to sales, to technology, and that then I could find a way to pull them all back together, and that was what the Salesforce Foundation um, presented that opportunity a couple of years later. Gotcha. I think, that, I, I think what's really interesting in your story is, is the overlap between people who really want to change the world and viewing technology as a lens through which the world can be changed, honestly, because, I mean, so full disclosure for everybody listening or not, uh, the eight <laughs> listeners that this vlog has so far, um, you know, full disclosure is, you know, I had the privilege of working with Jesse inside of salesforce.org. And I think one of the things that was most exciting is when I worked with you, it wasn't, you know, tech for tech's sake. It was really about 
enabling the change of the organization through the right kind of application of technology? And can we find the right solution and the right mix of things to really help an organization take where it's at and go someplace? Um, so I, I'm intensely curious because your role has now shifted inside of salesforce.org. What, what does this all mean for what you're doing now and how does what you're doing now connect to sort of furthering that vision? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I've been in now for 10-ish years a sales role in the salesforce.org ecosystem, primarily at salesforce.org and a couple of years at Exponent Partners. Um, and and at, uh, <laughs> at times a bit of a reluctant salesperson, though I, I love working with people. I love being a part of contributing to hopefully helping somebody's, uh, you know, an organization's ability to um, advance their mission. And I didn't come from a technology background. And I, I, I certainly have come to appreciate the impact of technology from sort of an applied sense. But I don't, you know, I was not a, I did, wasn't playing with computers. I wasn't sort of, I didn't have any formal technology training. Um, and, and I think that I still, you know, my orientation is towards how can it be applied and transformational? And you, you know, certainly over the years, all of us and, and others that are paying attention to this have heard and been a part of some of those really transformational stories that are extremely powerful. And, you know, you hear about it transforming the way an organization is able to connect with people who have life-threatening illnesses or to fight human trafficking on a global scale across multiple locations or environmental causes, and, and the list goes on. And I think those are, to me, the, the ones that are, you know, you, you get involved in those conversations and you align with, uh, you know, folks that are part of that conversation. It's really powerful. And so I've, you know, kind of kept on this path trying to find, you know, how can I, you know, uh, sort of contribute my experience and, and engage in a way that will ultimately, you know, be a part of that transformational story. And I've always been really interested in the humanitarian space and we've had I've had customers that were humanitarian organizations sort of by chance um, over my years and we have as as you know at salesforce.org worked with humanitarian organizations over the years but didn't necessarily have a really deep focus in it um, and <clears throat> you know uh, that's evolved and now over the last couple of years you know there's there's been some legwork done to invest further in the space, to commit to the space, to have people who have a deep, deep background in the space, you know, from an industry expertise standpoint, join the salesforce.org team and really guide some of the thinking and the, you know, the, the approach. You know, we've invested significantly more in the partnership with NetHope. Um, so there's just been, you know, a, a, a clear, you know, sort of um, action step towards, you know, showing up the right way. Um, and based on a number of things, there was an opportunity to uh, step into this role in the space. And to me, it was just a really compelling opportunity to, to do, continue the work, um, but to do it with uh, a, a pretty clearly carved out, you know, kind of subsector within the broader nonprofit space. How does it change from a traditional sales director role? I mean, I think you just said it in a sentence, mm -hmm. but like, I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I think one thing that I've heard time and time again is I've tried to be, you know, uh, approach this with a thoughtful approach and listen to folks that have been around the space is you got to be willing to sort of play the long game and you got to be, um, you know, you need people, people want to see people show up. Um, and so, um, you know, there's uh, different dynamics around just the use cases and the solutions, you know, certainly uh, folks in the field. I mean, so much of what these organizations are doing is really delivering services in the field and really interesting and often challenging circumstances, you know, whether that's around connectivity and um, remote locations and all that. And so that part's cool because the challenges are, are, are in interesting. So they're all interesting, you know, across the board of the organizations we work with. But to me, you know, how you have leverage the technology in a way in an environment that is, has some additional challenges to really serve, you know, and support program participants, um, you know, is, is really interesting. So that's one thing. And then two, I think it's just, you know, um, being willing to kind of show up in the space and, 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 and show our, you know, commitment to it and, and be, 
on some level, uh, find a way to balance the need to continue to grow the business uh, as we do, uh, but also be patient, um, which isn't always easy, but you know, try and figure out that balance. <laughs> yeah, I'm familiar with that balance. <laughs> Very familiar with it. Um, I've got two lines of questioning I wanna go down. One is, and I'll just say them now and then we'll get to them, but one is what makes humanitarian um, organizations different and that's just stuff that I've been learning over the last year. I think things that you've been learning. And then secondly, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of change with um, AEs in the in you know all all of these kinds of um, platforms. I guess I'm curious to to find out what you think organizations can do to maximize that relationship. <clears throat> you can you can jump to either one of those that you want and we'll just do the other one after. Great, yeah, good good questions. Um, uh, you know, I, humanita what makes a humanitarian organization different? I think, um, you know, in some ways there are some of their operating models are a little different than the kind of traditional nonprofit if there is one, you know, there's less like direct fundraising and, and uh, certainly there is that and there are organizations that are trying to do that really well uh, or grow that sort of side of their business. but. You know, a lot of them operate with uh, partnerships through government funded agencies like USAID and others. And that changes the dynamic of, you know, how they fund programs, how uh, they orient or, or direct, you know, um, budget towards technology projects that follow us very specific impact oriented program. So I think that's a different, you know, um, structure and, and operating um, kind of, you know, um, dynamic than maybe, you know, some of the again, a little more traditional nonprofits that are, again, it also just the, the, the domestic versus global nature. They're complex, they're big, you know, they're doing, they're, they're often, you know, some of the ones that we've worked on together and, and that are, um, you know, they, they operate on a global scale and they have multiple country locations and they have staff all over the world and they have field staff who are operating um, in a very different context than we are in the US and then, you know, maybe field staff uh, for organizations in the US. So I think that there's just a lot of layers and complexity. Um, you know, I'm sure there's others that'd be interested to hear other things that stand out for you, Tim, uh, with those organizations, but those are some of the things that come to mind. Yeah, I mean, definitely size and funding. It took me a while to get my head around funding, but it's something like, I, I don't really know, but it seems like a va like an overwhelming majority of the funds that they get are not from, you know, like the child sponsorship programs or, right. you know, th those kinds of things. It really is like, these are the organizations that governments, the UN, you know, all, all like nations are depending on these organizations to actually execute and make things happen with the funds that are being raised and made available. Um, right. And the, I think it's also been sort of, alarming to see just how incredibly hard it is to make any sense of all the data um, and yeah. that is not that is not because it's not well-meaning it's because you're working in places where there may not be internet um, or it may be spotty which is even worse and you know um, and so just the challenges that come from a global entity um, are, are significantly different and in some ways it feels like they're like you know, 15 nonprofits in one, yeah. and yeah. they almost all have like a domestic and an international, and and then there's um, you know an appropriate amount of accountability and hierarchy, but that makes it really challenging to know how to navigate and who to talk to. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that uh, hardness, I just think, yeah, wow, that hardness was eye opening to me. Like I followed a few of those discussions at this year's Net Hope, um, and. You know, I, I think one of the things that I, somebody said to me prior to Ed Hope was like, oh, be prepared for a bunch of presentations about how I got like mobile phone access working in remote areas and that sort of thing. And I was like, I, I didn't quite put the pieces together until I realized that hardness that Tim is talking about. It's so real for these organizations where, you know, it's not, if you think about access to the things that we take for granted here in the United States, you know, a decent bandwidth pipe, you know, electricity in some cases, cellular coverage for a mobile phone, like it's as fundamental as water 
to us. And when mm -hmm. you really see the absence of that, when you start working with one of these organizations where they're like, okay, so the way this team works is they're going to bring in 50 sheets of paper. How do we get that into technology? Yep. And you're like, well, Which there's some digital stuff. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, the problem is, is in that particular mountain region, they don't have power. And you're like, right. okay, so, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it takes problem solving yeah. to a whole new level. Yeah. And, you know, to hear these organizations articulate the needs of the global South and, and what we would traditionally call racial justice needs here in the United States at NetHope this year was humbling, but it also really contextualized, you know, sort of a very, very difficult operational parameter around which technology has to wrap itself. Yeah. Yeah. That's partly, though, because technology actually can play one of the most important roles, which is transfer of information. And, mm -hmm. you know, like in increasing the, the, the degree to which we can trust data increases the pipe of information, which really does make decision making significantly different. And this isn't just basic reports. This is really like fulfilling the requirements of a grant so that you can get funded for a second year, for which there are people whose entire livelihoods now depend on that funding. Um, yeah. You know, so I think um, I think that was eye opening for me as well when I got when, when we started working with that. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of one of our goals at Now It Matters is to really work with organizations um, from you know humanitarian aid level all the way down to thrive that is you know down the block from me and on a on a small budget and doing really amazing local work and i think it's important for the context of being able to see that spectrum jesse i feel like you've done that in the course of your career um, i know that because of you know where i met you but then also just um you know conversations that you and i have had i know that you keep your eye on those types of organizations as well um, I, I, get, I am curious what you think about the relationship with AEs. I'm also curious about where you feel like you've seen Salesforce really step it up and help organizations yeah. at all levels. That was that was going to be the question that I, I know I told you I wasn't going to ambush you, but I was going to be my question. And that is like, <laughs> you know, in addition to Tim's, like, you know, where is Salesforce really putting its big bets on this that you're seeing and how is that playing itself out? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think um, I've had different times along the way where I've, you know, I mean, I've been for a long time on the inside of Salesforce.org uh, with, again, a little bit of a, a time, uh, you know, a, a chapter where I was still very much in the ecosystem, but not in the walls of, of the Salesforce building. Uh, I think that, uh, and, and the organization has grown and changed, a, you know, a ton. I mean, when I started at Salesforce, with the Salesforce Foundation, there were 50 people, 43 maybe globally. There were five or six of us on the sales, the newly formed kind of social enterprise sales team. And one thing I think is true throughout that is um, important for folks to know and, and hopefully people, you know, are, are um, see uh, through kind of some of the noise is at least for me, I've seen a consistent thread of a commitment to having an impact on improving the state of the world through the assets that, that we have or that Salesforce has. And, you know, people don't, for the most part, you know, maybe every once in a while, but I think all, all things considered, for the most part, people don't end up at a place like Salesforce.org by accident, right? There's a lot of places somebody could go and sell software. And so I think that, uh, you know, most people are at salesforce.org because there's an opportunity, you know, and we're talking specifically right now about AEs, but I think people come there because it's an opportunity to do that work in a way that is working with nonprofit and higher education organizations to leverage this great technology asset to help them do their work better and to be a part of having a positive impact. And I think that that's true throughout. And I, you know, when I left and went to Exponent for a little while, and then I came back. I was at our sales kickoff and I thought, man, I've been gone for two ish years and the organization has grown a ton, but this, the theme of the stories, like the arc of the stories was, was still the same and they were bigger and they were buried, but it was like, you know, the nature of working in this space sort of provides a bit of a North star, right? Where like the stories were about 
How are we helping organizations reach their constituents, you know, reach their donors, support their, you know, program participants? I mean, it, it's like the stories continued to kind of cultivate and build on themselves. And that to me was reassuring. And I think that, um, you know, there are folks come for a reason and with an intention to be a part of uh, an organization that offers an opportunity to have an impact through this technology, you know, uh, through this, through these, this sort of avenue. And I think, excuse me, that said, you know, folks are also, uh, there's some certain parameters around how, how the, how the process works and being able to, you know, uh, be successful in building the business and growing the business, which you're tasked as uh, part of that process as an AE. And so you're trying to balance those things of how do I, number one, put the customer first and really focus on customer success? And how do I, as an AE, do it in a way that enables me to hit a number and be successful? Because if not, I won't get to continue doing this and I won't be able to hold, help these customers. So there is certainly an I don't know if it's a tension, but there's a there's a constant balance of that. And I think that most people are trying to do that well. And people do want to know, you know, I think if there's an openness to a conversation from organization XYZ, that people want to engage and people want to want to work in partnership. We say it a lot and there's always something, not always, but sometimes there's a little wink around like, are you a partner or a vendor? But I think people do as individuals want to engage in a way that feels as as partner oriented as possible i'm sure that you know this but we work more closely with you than any other ae um some of that is just the accounts we work on together a lot of that is because i just know that you've always got customer best interest in mind um not that others don't i just know that about you and um i feel like one thing i want to highlight here is that there like doing this work well and seeing success really requires a three-legged stool of a client, a partner, and a uh, sales force. And you're, you're the representative of Salesforce, um, you know, when, when we're working together. And I just feel like it's worth saying, there's no question here, although you can feel free to comment, just saying that it is actually very different working in tight partnership with an AE, whereas in a lot of our accounts that are smaller, the AE has so many that it's harder for them to pay attention to. And also for working with them, chances are that account's not burning down. And so it's easier to <laughs> be like, we got that one covered and move on to some that aren't. Um, yeah, so if you wanna comment on that, you're welcome to. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have a lot to add. I think, yeah, there's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, certainly a balance in, in you know, um, the size of organizations and the size of the number of organizations you're trying to support as an AE. Um, and for me, that's some of what is really, um, you know, interesting and engaging around working with these strategic organizations that you have the ability to focus and really try and be a part of the, the ongoing conversation. Um, and I think people try to do that, but yeah, it can be challenging when, you know, you get to a, a broader number of folks that you're trying to support and, and cover in one way or another. Yeah. I know, like Jesse, Salesforce.org has a few different buckets in terms of how it's working with particular groups of customers based on those organizations' kind of trends and ambition and utilization of technology. Mm -hmm. Have you seen in your own kind of now domain which bucket most of the humanitarian organizations are falling into? Is it still kind of a is it still there all over the gamut or is there like a trend line approaching their, approaching how they want to address technology? Like in terms of like, do they want to grow with it? Do they just want to do other things with it? You, do you know what I'm making reference to? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, at least, you know, I work with, with 15 ish kind of strategic net hope members. Uh, and I have a, a, a counterpart that does has a similar number of, of, of similar organizations that we kind of cover across the US. And I think that um, those organizations are, um, you know, there's a good number of them that are uh, on board with in one way or another, this idea and the importance of digital transformation and see the Salesforce platform as a, as a you know, an opportunity to do that. There are obviously other platforms out there and there are folks that have worked with other platforms for longer or 
you know, what have you, have invested in different things to support their mission. So I think that it varies across. I mean, I think it's an interesting focus to be, you know, really zeroed in on a, on this kind of specific space, right? I mean, even, even um, you know, if you're in NGO or higher ed, uh, you know, particularly if you're in NGO as an AE, you're covering a wide range. I mean, there might be 10 different sort of sub verticals, you know, there's environmental and there's space-based and there's political and there's, you know, uh, there's, you know, um, you know, disease and disorder and on and on and on, right? There's just so many things to focus on that it's easy to, it, you know, sort of, it's hard to know, hard to really like get into the space and understand the nuances of each organization. Um, and so I think that that's, that's what I see happening is, is us really trying to understand and be a, be a part of the space and then figure out how to best, um, you know, bring the Salesforce uh, technology and other assets to bear there. And so, you know, one of the challenges is just like, how do we, how do we leverage not just CRM, but the broader platform to really not only do the work at HQ, but, get it out into the field with program participants and people, you know, in country, in the field doing the work. And that's not easy for all the reasons that we've talked, some of the reasons we've talked about already, as well as, you know, the dynamics of access and licensing and all those things. And so, you know, that's all stuff to, to figure out within this kind of, you know, framework of how, how, how we are able to support customers at Salesforce. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, the last time that I traveled, Jesse, I was hanging out with you in San Diego, and um, I remember sitting at lunch with you and Brian. What's Kramer hanging out? Jono. How does that even <laughs> yeah, happen? Yeah. Anymore? I remember yeah. you know. it was not. It was not on Zoom. It was actually yeah. at a table without <laughs> masks. Sitting, what were we breathing doing? on each other? What's wrong yes, with all, all of you? Place, well, under the six nilly. foot limitation. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I, I mean it was crazy, um, and I remember. Um, talking with you about guidance, uh, digital guidance, which is our model on, on transformation and focusing on configuring the customer. There you go. Um, <laughs> configuring the customer, um, not just the technology. Um, I've since had several conversations with you about that. And uh, I felt like you said really nice things about that when we talked. So I was hoping that you'd say really nice things about that again. <laughs> Of Transition, course, are course. you still right. saying nice things yeah, about it? Like, there's, a good, there's a good starter question. <laughs> It'd be awkward Can we leave the witness the a little more? Just, the lights went down here, right? Uh, I, like, I, I like the name. Uh, <laughs> this is where Jesse's like, I'm sorry, you're breaking up. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, but no, that's, uh, I absolutely remember the conversation. And I do think that it's really valuable because, um, you know, we talk, we, I've had conversations internally with our, customer success group and folks from that group in the last couple of weeks where, you know, there's an awareness for, you know, I mean, the technology is great, but it's a tool. And if you don't know how to use it or you don't have people adopting it, then it is not that great, you know, it's, uh, it sits there. And so I think that um, having folks have sort of that, you know, support to understand like the process of change management and user adoption and all those things that are ultimately where kind of the rubber meets the road is absolutely critical. And I think, you know, uh, you have done that well. Now it matters has done that well. And Tim, that's something I feel like I think of you've done well in terms of kind of the, the framing. Like you I remember the, the, the flight plan uh, <laughs> framing a while wow, ago. Wow, I'm so and, impressed. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow, that's amazing. Um, yeah, exactly. I just think you have been in tune with that need to help uh, organizations not just get the technology, uh, but actually the whole sort of process and the people and the technology. And, you know, we all, uh, I was talking about it with somebody outside of the nonprofit space uh, that is a, use a Salesforce in the commercial space. And they were talking about how frustrating it is because they are in like an op kind of a sales ops role and uh, they were like struggling to get people to use the tool. And I was like, well, it makes you feel any better. That's, you are not alone. Um, you know, I just <laughs> yeah. think like, so to have that, you know, to really help people, you know, work their way through this journey, it's not just get the technology and you're good, right? Everybody, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's much more than that and, and it can be under underestimated. So to have that guidance, to tie it to, programmatic impact and and to just really, you know, sort of, you know, I don't know, 
pave the road or, or show the way, lead the way a little bit, you know, I think that that um, is really significant for the, for the long-term success and value of this, this or any other, you know, Salesforce or any other platform. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the you. way I look at this is, you know, technology doesn't solve problems. It's people right. who solve problems and, and technology enables people. So, right. I mean, you know, when you look at like the value proposition of something like Salesforce in particular, you know, one of the things I think of as an incredible person enablement is, for example, like the Lightning UI, right? That how that makes the everyday experience of somebody otherwise going into a tool, you know, very simple and very easy to understand, you know, and I've seen a lot of things in my time, like 15 years in IT, you see a lot mm -hmm. of like interfaces and it, you can always figure out the ones where it was like, this was designed with people in mind versus this is <laughs> yep. the one that was designed with nerds in mind. Right. And I put myself in the nerd box, by the way. I never say nerd <laughs> disparagingly. So, but so yeah. say, you know. We put you in that box too. Ooh, thank Absolutely. you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, you know, I, I not, to, say not that... to ignite a, 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 a loyalty war in another realm, but there's a reason why, you know, Apple and the iPhone have had, you know, so much success, oh, right? Like people use sure. it. People are, you know, I mean, when you can, you know, when it makes sense and you can access something and you can, you know, you, like the, that, it sort of almost feels obvious, but there's a reason that user experience and people actually using the technology is what really builds momentum. Well, there's also that concept of like choice, right? And, <clears throat> right. you know, Blair Enns hits on this a lot. Uh, he was a speaker at the, San, at the Salesforce.org Partner Summit this year. And, you know, the idea that what we don't want to do is actually make organizations who have to make a lot of hard choices every day, make more hard choices about their technology. Yeah. You know, I think that's where that principle really applies in this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say that um, the way that I explain digital guidance to my mom is that if you aren't seeing results at the gym, then you need to get a personal trainer because... You're not going to see, if you change gyms, that's not, not going to improve anything. That said, the quality of the gym really matters. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and that when, when, we're, when we think about Salesforce platform, that is a very high quality enterprise grade, best in class software that you, like, you actually need to start with a good gym in mind. Um, and even in places where we are helping people understand their like the gyms that they're in, if they need to move out, um, there's a reason that we first eye uh, NPSP as one of the places that is likely a, a good home for that. And a lot of it is actually UI related. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of data capture tools out there, uh, but the UI on them is, is not as flexible, um, you know, and, and all the rest, you know, just go down the list. So right. uh, I do want to say the gym really matters. The product actually matters. Um, and, you know, uh, Salesforce has an, um, an amazing product that has been built by the community. And I think that's part of the reason it's so amazing, right. you know? Right. So um, I was just thinking of gyms and applying it to a shared experience that Jesse and I have. And that is we always keep it's about skiing because uh, <laughs> it turns out we ski at the same mountain in Tahoe. Which, by the way, Squaw Alpine will be changing its name by summer 2021. I don't know if you caught that. That's right. Oh, yep. yeah. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, I kind of, you know, one of the things that the racial justice movement brought up this summer was the power of names. And mm -hmm. they got right out ahead of it. And they were like, yep, it's too late for this year, but we're absolutely going to do it for next year. And this is a flat out racist name. And we're going to acknowledge that and own it. So, wow, That's yeah, impressive. Yeah, no, it was yeah. great. But Jesse and I always kibitzed about skiing at the same place because I was like, oh, did you hit like KT22 or <laughs> did you hike up Granite Chief? Or I have a really funny video of me going off a cornice at Granite Chief and flopping down and doing like right into the snow, you know, like all that stuff. <laughs> all right. I went skiing with Tracy yeah. and it was so humiliating. I feel like, you know, growing <laughs> up in Montana, like we actually have mountains out here as opposed to where Tracy grew up. 
Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. true. New England has no There's mountains. We have big so hills. I, I'm just with ice. That. It's snowboarder. So anyway. And I was like, yeah, but you, but, but in Tracy's, de- you know, defense, or or uh, you know, or in your defense, maybe Tim. I'm not sure. Uh, I I I have a. That was a part of my life before where we're at now that was uh i was born and raised in the middle of the mountains in colorado and oh, yeah, i then. got way into skiing and i ski race yeah. really seriously and uh, there were a lot of very very good ski racers that come out of the east coast because when you learn to ski yeah. on ice rock yeah, solid you can ice, ski anywhere you watching californians you know? on that ice, is yeah. my greatest that, that does make sense it's like yeah. they ski in the it? worst conditions every time yeah. you there was one it. day where we had a super out how to do it slope and i just like I was like, I'm going to just be that person and look like a total, you know, you know, jerk on the slopes. So like, I was like, I'm just going to like hit the top of this and then I'm going to skate around and then I'm going to slide sideways to backwards with my hands up and just like look around spinning at everybody else. And like, so I did this like pirouette down the trail and everybody else. This was intentional. A choreographed fall. Yeah, no, it was like a choreographed like dance the whole way down an ice sheet. While everybody yeah. else around me was falling, and I was like, <laughs> I grew up in New England. That's yeah. Crazy. This stuff that makes sense. Yeah. Hear me. In Montana, we're like, let's don't go. It's icy out. Yeah. <laughs> let's wait till, we'll, we'll wait till Tuesday. Yeah. Um, full yeah. disclosure on this, Tim, do you want to talk like really quickly what's going on for you today as we record and also give Jesse a minute for a final word? Uh, yeah. Because right. this is also relevant to life right now, folks. Yeah, so uh, I just went in for our COVID test this morning. Definitely um, hoping hoping for the best. In Montana, that is a two to ten day turnaround. <laughs> so I think they're <laughs> delivering that those vials by horse to some place in Helena, you know, and then stage coaching them back next week. So it's enough um, time for you to give it to your whole family and community. Yeah, and realize yeah. That's no, what you gave to them. So I'm totally quarantined off from my family and. Um, you know, uh, ho- hoping for the best here. Fever's gone down and all that, but yeah, that's that's you gotta real stay life. True. You got to stay true to that rural Western setting. You know, I like that <laughs> the imagery of it being you know delivered by the horse. I was just totally. like, my way of keeping it real for the old West was like, Tim, you're not canceling this recording. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I did tell somebody. We got internet, but not color internet, and they, because I was blocking, and they, and I felt really bad when they believed me, and then I had to like unwind that a little bit. So, yeah. Jesse, <laughs> any other sort of parting thoughts or comments? It's been so great just catching up. I know my kids in the background; they're going to offer some parting thoughts or comments. It sounds like um, I. Uh, you know, I don't know. I appreciate the opportunity to join the two of you. And, and as you we've talked about, there's a lot of history and uh, very kind of various contexts. But um, I think the, the consistent thread through all of that has been a real desire to just do good work and contribute to people, uh, you know, doing good work and, and, and impacting the missions of a lot of really important organizations. And uh, I think that's true across this community in a lot of ways. I think there's more of that than not. And sometimes it's, you know, not as, you know, there's a lot of other noise. uh, But I think that, um, you know, there's a desire to make a positive impact. And, uh, and so, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to join this blog. I hope I've done it done it justice uh and and uh definitely and i'm hopeful that tim is going to get good results when the horse comes and whenever however long that takes and uh yeah. and yeah i'd love to, to to keep these type of conversations going i think there's a lot a lot more to uh you know what we all share in this community than sometimes it's clear by a, a title or a organization or what have you agreed well thanks for your for your good work uh long-term friendship and yeah. and keep it up uh, keep keep doing that work. We need it done, especially in the humanitarian. Uh, it, it that needs to be all hands on deck. Like mm-hmm. there's so yeah. much change potential there. So it's really heartening to see that, yeah. uh, and particularly your role, and particularly you in it. So thank you, and keeping with tradition. That's all, folks. <laughs> thank you both. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. We'll talk day. to you soon. All right. All right Thanks. Bye. You too. Bye.